all of these, I'll start out with the different forms. Those are the pools, right? And then I'll talk about the fluxes between those pools. Nitrogen gas, the majority of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas. It's also dissolved in reasonably high concentrations in essentially all fresh waters. Nitrous oxide, what's the common name or, or popular name for that gas? laughing gas, right? So it's actually a, a narcotic of sorts, um, but it also is, is produced by natural processes um, and is a, a very important greenhouse gas. It, it, it's like methane, it is very much more active in absorbing or um, infrared light uh, than carbon dioxide. And so small amounts of it make big difference. We have ammonia, NH4+. Plus. That's the ionic form. NH3 plus is the gaseous form of ammonia, right? Ammonia is NH3. Ammonia is the ion NH4. If you make ammonia base, uh, ammonium basic, right, then it's going to convert <coughs> over to NH3, and the NH3 is actually a toxic gas. So that's why you, in, with household cleaning products, you don't mix bleach and ammonium cleaners because it puts off ammonia gas, and that's not good for you. And then we can become more and more oxidized nitrite, and this is on the pathway from nitrate to ammonium. Nitrite is a toxic little molecule. It bonds with hemoglobin. That's a bad thing. We'll talk about that a little bit. And nitrate is the most oxidized inorganic form that we'll talk about. major fluxes that we'll talk about, uptake, mineralization or remineralization, denitrification, nitrification, DNRA, and fixation. And then we'll put them all together into the nitrogen cycle. So the first point is uptake. And we have uptake happens through the GOGAT pathway. And essentially, you just take glutamic acid and you cycle it with glutamine produce all the cellular organs in. So essentially, everything that comes into the cell, the most important thing, everything that comes into the cell has to come in through the ammonium ion. Right. Therefore, all organisms have to take up ammonia, whether they're in oxidized or organic, or, or, you know, or anoxic conditions, unless they take it up as organic and to start with. If an organism needs an alternative source of nitrogen, if they're using inorganic nitrogen, there's no ammonium around, then they'll start using other sources. They can use nitrate, or they can go through nitrogen fixation to take nitrogen gas to ammonia. Only non-eukaryotic organisms can fix nitrogen. So there's, we've already nixed out a bunch of organisms that can use N2. But of even those that can use nitrogen in nitrogen fixation, it is extraordinarily energy intensive to do that. What is it about the bond in a nitrogen N2 molecule? What is that bond that makes it so difficult to break? Triple bond? It's a triple bond, right? There's a triple bond there. It takes basically three electrons plus six ATPs to drive that reaction. It is the most expensive metabolic reaction that there, that there is, actually. So you better be energy rich and nitrogen poor before it becomes evolutionarily worth your while to break down nitrogen. It also takes quite a few electrons to and, and energetic power to take nitrate to ammonia. And you have to first reduce it to nitrite and then take it to ammonia. So this says evolutionarily, if you're taking up nitrogen, what form would you prefer first? Inorganic nitrogen. If you rely on inorganic nitrogen, what form would you take up first? Nitrogen. What's the cheapest energy-wise? Not nitrate. 
I just told you it takes electrons and, and energy to take nitrate to ammonium, right? Ammonium, right? Because ammonium's the first one that you have to take it in as ammonium, right? If it takes energy to convert the other forms to ammonium, you're gonna you're gonna prefer ammonium. So if we look at ammonium concentrations in most natural waters, they're turning over really quickly. Everybody's taking up ammonium first. And then if it runs out, they start trying to use the nitrate. If that runs out, then it's nitrogen fixation. The nitrogen fixation we talked about, so it's, expected, it's very expensive energetically. Um, only bacteria known to fix nitrogen. One of the key points of this reaction and the adaptations to do it are that nitrogenase is sensitive to oxygen. So oxygen deactivates the enzyme that is responsible for converting N2 gas to ammonia. So you need to have an adaptation to deal with it or do it in an anoxic environment. It turns out that there's also globally another important source of, of yeah, nitrogen uh, yeah, fixation. We start looking at a way to because nitrogen items. gas can there. convert to nitrate via um, lightning. There's so much energy in lightning that it can rip that triple bond apart and react with the oxygen. In particular, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria can be quite important in like nitrogen cycles. And also, if you dump a bunch of phosphorus, and we'll talk about eutrophication, if you dump a bunch of phosphorus into a lake, force it towards nitrogen fixation, you're basically selecting for the cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen to get big blooms because they don't have to get their nitrogen from other sources. They can pull it out of the atmosphere. So the cyanobacteria, um, I like cyanobacteria, I'm a cyanobacteriophile, and part of that's because they have very interesting adaptations to deal with. They're, they're very problematic, but they also have very interesting adaptations to deal with things. They are survivors, They've been, they're the first fossil that we know, right? Uh, but one of the way, re reasons that some of them are quite successful is their capacity to fix nitrogen. So we have here a heterocyst, and the heterocyst has a number of things it does to keep that nitrogenous, nitrogenase away from oxygen and to shunt energy into the reaction because it's very energy expensive. The first is, is that they have a wall that is fairly impermeable to gases. So that keeps the oxygen from, from coming into it. It also keeps the nitrogen gas from coming into it, but they don't need it at very high rates, and so it, it's not going to be as limited. They can get enough in there for them. The second one, which is not on here, is that sometimes they have bacteria living inside of this gel, and the bacteria are respiring away oxygen as it comes in, but allowing the nitrogen, the nit leaving the nitrogen gas behind. So they are actually leaking out organic carbon and stimulating this reaction. And we'll talk about this again when we talk about microbe microbe interactions. They're stimulating the bacteria to grow on the outside of this heterocyst and use up oxygen. In addition to that, we have two photosystems in photosynthesis, photosystem one and photosystem two. And Photosystem two is where oxygen is generated in photosynthesis. But photosystem one still can take light and create ATP. It can't fix carbon in and of itself, but it can take light and, and generate ATP. Remember that reaction for N2 to, to ammonium requires a lot of ATPs. So they're still generating some ATP in there, but they're not generating oxygen. In contrast, these cells are generating oxygen and have photosystem one and photosystem two, so they're generating oxygen, fixing carbon, doing all of that. They, all, they then transport organic carbon at good rates into the heterocyst, right? So the respiration rates then can be elevated inside the heterocyst. Okay, so the next thing to talk about in water quality is nitrate con contamination. 
And in the United States, 10 milligrams per liter is the upper level of what's allowable in drinking water. In, um, in Europe, that's 20 milligrams per liter. Uh, and that's possibly because it's hard for them to find water that has less than 20 milligrams per liter there. Part, the reason for this is that this leads to methemoglobinemia. What that means is your hemoglobin gets bonded, it binds to nitrite, and that, that binding to nitrite makes it so oxygen can't get on it. It's also known as blue baby syndrome. And where this popped up is in infants that were <laughs> fed formula, that came from high nitrate groundwater and their stomachs are acidic and anaerobic and they, they create nitrite, the bacteria in their stomach creates nitrite from the um, a nitrate and then that nitrite binds to their hemoglobin and their, <coughs> their hemoglobin's all bound up and not red, it's blue, right? They're really blue blooded and they're completely blue. And so it causes them essentially to suffocate without, that's not funny. She's laughing at babies <laughs> dying because they're blue. <laughs> okay. Um, in addition to that, there's concern over the fact that, that, that nitrosamines can be generated. And so those are the things that are in sauces <coughs> and such that are, are not necessarily so good for you as well. Meat pres they're used as preservatives, but they're also not so good for you. So if you have a lot of nitrate in your drinking water, it's, it's a problem. The reason that the babies are susceptible to that, more susceptible than adults, is because such a large portion, if, if they're fed formula made with this water, such a large portion of their diet is actually comes from a liquid, right? As opposed to us where we don't take in that much water relative to the other stuff we bring in for our nutrition. Therefore, there's basically rules on how much nitrate you can drink. It, it's important because in Kansas, for example, about a third of the rural wells are actually have nitrate values that are higher than they should be um, by law. And so they, have, they can't use it for their drinking water. They have to bring in their drinking water from outside. A lot of that's from agricultural or livestock waste pollution moving its way down into the, into the groundwater. And it comes in the form of organics, but then those organics are essentially converted to nitrate through the nitrogen cycle process in the presence of oxygen, and then they move down into the groundwater and lead to those high concentrations. So it's a place where understanding the nitrogen cycle is important if you don't want to uh, cause this kind of, of toxicity. You said the well water has more than <coughs> 10 milligrams per liter? Yeah, about Ground a third water? of the well water in, can in rural, rural well waters have more than 10 milligrams per liter. That's why most rural areas are, are now on to, they actually have rural water districts that are producing water in small, you know, have small tanks and uh, water towers around Be because they don't want to, they can't, it's difficult for you to control the water quality in your, in your own system. And if you've got an old system, and it's, you know, before we knew about how to protect groundwater, and it's really connected to the surface, the things we did impacted that groundwater. It takes a long time for it to work out. Can it be filtered? No, um, it can't be filtered. It can be re removed with um, deionization. So whole system deionizers will do it, ion exchange systems. It's pretty expensive though. So yeah, some people have to have a whole house system that, that pulls that nitrate out of their drinking water because of that, because that's their only alternative, or, or ship in their drinking water. Um, so we can also think about how nitrate and ammonium are distributed in a lake, and we have nitrate on the top and ammonium on the bottom, and we have a lake that is going anaerobic uh, in the hypolimnion here, in this case, and we see that when it goes anoxic in the low oxygen areas, the nitrate concentrations get pretty low, right? And that's because nitrate's used for denitrification, and at really low redox can be shunted to ammonium, 
but at the very least, the nitrate's all used up, and the anaerobic processes like the fermentations and putrefactions are creating ammonia, mineralizing ammonia, and you bring it up here. If there's oxygen, if this is a hypolimnion and this is the ethylimnion, there's oxygen, where do you think the um, nitrifying bacteria are going to be found? <coughs> okay, so what are the nitrifying bacteria using as an energy source? They're oxidizing what compound? Ammonium, right? They're oxidizing ammonium. If there's a stratified lake, right, there's oxygen here, there's ammonium here, they're diffusing together right there, that's going to be in that, that sharp gradient is where those nitrifying bacteria are going to be. Again, you know, depth, time, you can see temporal trends and, and variation. In contrast, we have the whole thing oxidized, all that ammonium is converted over to nitrate by the nitrifiers that are used in these mixing periods. We have it completely distributed throughout. Um, we can also look at changes in nitrogen distribution in the stream. This is out of Kanza, and this is basically a uh, alternation between influence of, of high nitrate groundwater from under cropland and low nitrate groundwater from a pristine spring. So this is a pristine spring, Edler Spring, the one that you went down in, um, the one that has the isoposite that we saw in class. And we see that during times of high flow, the prairie stream is flowing from above down into the stream when we have low nitrate. But in times of low flow, the croplands nearby dominate the groundwater inputs and pump the nitrate way up. So you get this big annual changes in nitrate concentration related to what the source is. Illustrating again that agricultural practices are increasing nitrogen in these systems. The nitrogen cycle from scratch, as you will have to as well. And we have the oxic and the anoxic sections. And then we have to align nitrate, ammonium and nitrite from the right to the left from the most oxidized to the least oxidized, or, the, or from the left to the right, from the most reduced to the most oxidized, if you want to put it that way. So which of those forms is the most oxidized? Nitrite, nitrate, or ammonium? NO2, NO3, or NH4? Is the most oxidized? It's most reduced, right? So ammonium, H4 plus, most reduced, and then what's the next one? Nitrite, Nitrite right? NO2 minus, and nitrate. And then we always put what over here? What do we throw over there, regardless of the oxidation reduction state? Organic matter, right? So in this case, it would be organic and uh, you know amino acids, proteins, DNA, whatever. And then the other forms that we have to worry about are nitrogen gas. And I will also put nitrous oxide in here. So from lecture before, what form of inorganic nitrogen has to be assimilated? Nitrate, nitrite, or ammonium? Ammonium. Ammonium, right? So we have this assimilation here of, of ammonium. And if they use nitrate, they have to convert it to nitrite and then ammonium, right? So the assimilatory pathway regardless of whether there's oxygen there or not, it has to run from nitrate to ammonia. What's the other way that organisms can assimilate nitrogen? Other than nitrate or nitrite, what's the other form they can use? Nitrogen. 
It's very energetically costly. Nitrogen. Pardon? Um, it's one of the triple bond. Right. <laughs> That one. Nitrogen yeah. gas, and what's the process called of, of assimilating nitrogen gas? Fixation. Nitrogen fixation, right? And if you remember, it goes through ammonium, actually. So N fixation. So if uh, there's some ammonium floating around and it gets converted to nitrate, is that going with or against potential energy? In, I'm sorry, in an oxidized environment. It's going with potential energy, right? So what type of organisms basically gain energy from doing that? What's the process called first? Going from ammonia to what? To nitrate, to nitrite, and then to Great, the overall process. Anybody remember that one? Okay, nitrification. And what's the broad classification for organisms that make their living from chemical energy? Autotrophs, right? And if they're using chemical energy, then what type of autotroph are they? Chemoautotrophs. Good. Okay. Um, I did mention that there's another form of nitrogen fixation that converts nitrogen gas to nitrate. It occurs in the atmosphere. Anybody remember that one? Right. It's a, it's a basically an abiotic process. So there is actually. That's my lightning symbol there. Um, and then we're, we're missing a couple more fluxes. If you take nitrogen to nitrogen gas, if you take nitrate to nitrogen gas and use nitrate as an electron acceptor to oxidize organic carbon, what is that flux process? What is that called? It's sort of, but not really the opposite of the one on the top. Exactly. <laughs> and some of this can escape through nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. So that's one of the big concerns about nitrogen pollution in fresh waters and in the ocean is that it will increase nitrous oxide input to the atmosphere. And nitrous oxide is not only a greenhouse gas, a quite potent greenhouse gas, but also when it gets into the upper atmosphere, it destroys ozone. And, and so there's concern about increased UV related to nitrous oxide. It turns out that actually the nitrification process does also have nitrous oxide as an intermediate, and so you can lose some there, but I won't, I won't that so much. And then I also mentioned that under really low redox conditions, you can get actually reduction of nitrate to ammonium. And that's a simulatory reduction of nitrate to ammonium. Okay, so th this is in the case where you're in so, such low redox that, that this ammonium actually has substantially less potential energy than nitrogen gas, so it becomes energetically efficient to do that. What is that nitrogen The simulatory reduction of nitrate to ammonia. And I think in the textbook I just call it the simulatory reduction. <coughs> and then the remaining flux that I'd like you guys to know about, remaining fluxes, or one that I said was the first part of putrefaction, right? So it's essentially fermentation. When you break down proteins, you have extra ammonium, you kick it out. And it's also referred to as a modification, but we'll just call it fermentation process. So it's just sort of similar to the CO2 coming out of fermentations as well. And 
mineralization in oxic environments. So, so most, most fishes uh, excrete their nitrogen as ammonia, right? And most aquatic organisms excrete their nitrogen as ammonia. Why is it that terrestrial animals don't excrete their nitrogen as ammonia? Why do you need water? Because uh, what's wrong it's with really the acidic for me to mm, Sort of, you're getting there. And why don't I have a bladder full of ammonia right now? What would it do to me? I think it's pretty it? toxic. It's toxic. It would kill me, right? So if you go, you got to dilute it out, so there's not enough water. Like you said, a fish, you know, has unlimited amounts of water to dilute its waste out of, so <coughs> it's a lot more energy efficient to excrete nitrogen as ammonia than it is to synthesize it into an organic compound that then can be concentrated and not toxic, such as urea that we use. And the very last flux is always this heterotrophic or metabolic rearrangement of organic N. So we eat proteins, we break them down to amino acids, we assimilate them into proteins, that's all just cycling, rearrangement of organic nitrogen.